There we go. Now I'm not muted. I apologize. I forgot to unmute it. So, but uh, we'll turn the time over to Mr. Chatterton for the budget presentation. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah, this is a, a workshop. If you have questions, feel free to ask Mr. Chatterton. The board will do our best to answer our questions around so that we all can understand it a little, a little better. A question on format before you begin. Do you want to save all questions to the end of the meeting? Do you want them? Mr. Chatterton? I think for the presentations, this is a one shot, but the whole budget will be reviewed through the, uh, once it's presented at the, I believe, May meeting for approval in the June meeting. Anytime between now and when the budget is approved, everything's open for comments and questions and anything that happens. And, and I'd like just to reiterate that these are just these are just budget requests from the departments. None of it is final, and nothing would be final until we see how it all fits together and we start putting everything together in middle of May, first part of or middle of April, first part of May. So will that also be up to the public here to push, put it all together? It will through the public process through the board meetings like we have done it in the past all the time, yes. I would imagine what's going to happen is there's probably going to be another uh, budget presentation at the first part of April, or first part of May. So we can kind of run through the general fund and said, here's what we were looking at, this is what's changed, these are the new positions we created, this is what we reallocated, you know, here's where the department budgets ended up, and just kind of go through everything like that. The first meeting that we had was uh, three weeks ago, and it was just, it was, uh, it was all of the new staffing requests that's been asked by the principals and the public for the new schools, or for the schools. And I believe that that list was 20.7 FTEs, uh, amounting to about $1.5 million. Just say what it's a full-time equivalency person. So it's like 20 point, a, a point seven FT is like about a 70% employee. All of the information, the presentation is on the board or is on the website, and all of the documentation that the principals sent to me requesting the budget, those positions are on the website as well. This is already on the website as well as all of the documentation from all of the department heads requesting their budget. It's all on the website now. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's about 1.5 million. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. So this is no, this is department budget request for the consideration. This is fiscal year 2014-15, which begins July 1st, 2014, and this is two part two of a series of five. Okay. The first thing I want to bring everybody's attention to is this is this these are very small portions of the overall general fund budget. Today we're going to talk about the department budgets and the program budgets. Next week we'll talk about the school budgets and the athletic budgets. But all of those combined equates to about between 14 and 15 percent of the general fund budget. And for example, in fiscal year 2010, with the actual expenditures, that this group of 
of uh, budgets that we're talking about represented 16.42 percent. In 2011-12, it was 14.89. 2012-13, it was 14.48. And this year, it's projected at about 14 percent. So you can see the, the comments that we've made before stating that these department budgets are a small portion of, of the general fund budget. It's the majority of the general fund budget is all salaries and benefits. And that equates to about 85 to 86 percent of the general fund budget is salaries and benefits for staff that we have. And like I said before, these are, these are just budget requests from the departments. Nothing will be approved until the board actually adopts these in June. And at some point in time, you know, we'll look at how all of these numbers come together and determine whether or not there's funds available in the budget with, uh, to be able to grant these or if we have to go back to the departments and say we need to cut back or just how we're going to do that. Okay, we'll start out with the transportation points. And the way, the way this is laid out is I have five years of history in each one of these categories about where their budgets were. Now these are only budgets, they're not actual expenditures. So what I'm doing is looking at the actual budget requests from each one of these departments at the beginning of the year, not at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, because sometimes these budget numbers change throughout the course of the year. So I want to be consistent and just look at, at a point in time, the beginning of the year for each one of these. So when we get into the next slides, you'll see each one of the years for the past five years, or the past four years compared to the next year to show some kind of a trend over time. Okay, so to be start these uh, spreadsheets out that's going to come later, what I want to do is point out some things that I see in these, the next slides. So for example, in the transportation budget for next year, bus parts has shown a slight increase. And that's because that has been over budget continually for the past three years. And we'll look at that here in a second. Contracted services category includes copier maintenance agreements, bus routing software license renewals, and monthly bus radio communication services. In lieu transportation is to reimburse parents for transporting students in outlying areas to the new bus stop. For example, if we have students that live over Galena, and they transport their students to a bus stop that would be picked up from Hemingway Elementary. We pay mileage to those parents over Galena and back to transport their students so we don't have to send a bus out, just like we do for Magic. We do that way as well. So it's an in lieu transportation. It's reimbursed by the state of Idaho, the transportation department. Is that common? Yes. For it is common for our district. I believe we probably have maybe seven in lieu contracts in place right now where, where, where parents transport students to the nearest bus stop. Okay, so we'll get into this and this is the transportation department that's only dealing with the yellow buses to and from school. So like I said, here's the comparison of the five years contracted services. You see it's very consistent across. On the bottom, every one of these columns are totaled to show where that budget has been over the last five years. Uh, and like I addressed earlier, the parts number increase, requested increase from $82,500 to $125,000 this fiscal year. And it's because those bus part category accounts have been consistently over budget for the last several years. So we're trying to get caught up with the actual budgets. Is that due to the fact that the parts are more expensive or due to the fact that the buses are breaking down more often? I, it's, it's, it's not that, it's not of a big factor as the buses are breaking down more often because all of our buses are within 10 years old. It's a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty well maintained fleet. I would imagine that it's, a lot of it is because the bus parts are increasing. Correct, yeah, the, the, the cost for tires, the cost for parts, a lot of them have grown quite a bit over the last couple of years and that's what we're trying to keep track of. Cost of tires is increased because of the cost of oil to produce yeah. them. So, yeah. Mike, on this, um, I'm seeing uh, a significant increase in insurance. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what the why that is? Yeah, the insurance. I'll get into it on another slide. I was okay. going to bring attention to it, but we'll address it here then, and we'll skip it over there. But uh, in fiscal year 2000. 
10, 11, we went out for uh, requests for qualification of proposals on insurance coverage. We didn't feel like that we were getting a very good deal on an insurance company that we had in place, and we d ended up changing insurance companies for substantially less money. But what you're seeing here is the effects of a couple of major claims that we've had oh. with the transportation that's affecting the insurance premiums. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you also describe the difference between contracted services and contract transportation, just real briefly? Contracted services is if we, well, contracted services is for, like on the prior, said, the prior slide said, it, it, it includes copier maintenance agreements, routing software, and bus radio communication system. Okay. Contracted transportation is if we had to go out and contract a bus for services. If we had to go out and hire a bus because one of ours breaks down, we have to lease a bus to get our kids home or something like that. That's what contracted. That's what would be the contract transportation. Okay. Okay. Okay, so here's a graphical chart of that uh, budget of where it's gone in the last five years, the trend. And what I've done is I've graphed every one of these five year trends. Yes? So these are all budgeted numbers. We're not looking at actuals. We're looking at budget numbers only, not actuals. And the reason for the budget significant jump between 13 and 14 was because you were going over budget regularly in those previous three years. Is that what I heard you say before? And it's mostly, if you look at this, it's mostly in the parts category. I mean, that budget is jumping about $42,500. And a lot of that is made up between the, the uh, parts and the insurance. So okay. for the... That was a good point that was brought up about the actuals. So for like, like the actuals of parts for this past year or the year before, what would that be? Was that what that new number was based on? Yes, it was. It, it was based on a trend of what's that actually expended out of those accounts for the last several years. So can you go back to that? So this year we spent about 125000 on it parts. would have been in the fiscal year 2013-14. Right. Yes. 13-14, we spent about 100. Well, 12-13, because we haven't got through the right. fiscal okay. year 13-14. Okay. So we had budgeted 72,000, but we spent over 100,000. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Sure. I'll ask Rask. Uh, parts, typically we uh, check with the different auto parts stores that are here in the area mm -hmm. and, uh, and just purchase those parts as we need them. We don't, uh, you know, common things that we, that we replace all the time, filters and stuff like that, mm -hmm. then we typically uh, have the opportunity to take some time and search for where to get those the most reasonable price. Um, however, we don't always have that luxury, and so sometimes it's, it's who has the part in stock that we can use. something that would be beneficial. Uh, we're in the process now of tracking our parts where we've gone to an automated system on our parts. We're, so we're determining what those levels are on average you know, per year, how many of whatever we use, that kind of thing. So we are trying to build that history so that we can look at that in the future. One of the considerations that I would think about is, is a, some kind of a warehouse storage to be able to, to accumulate these parts. You know, if we knew we were going to use X amount of parts over the course of the year. We would buy those in, in mass, but we would have to store those at some place in time. So, I mean, we would have to look at that, too, to see well, how that would impact it. Okay. Here's the service vehicles. Now, this is for all of the maintenance vehicles. 
would be the maintenance department, the technology department, food service, those types of things, the administrative cars. And that's the five-year history of, of what those budgets are, can, are at. This is also would include, uh, for example, the travel would be for that travel, those travel expenses that are not reimbursed by the State Department of Education would be included in here. Do you have somewhere listed, like, how many vehicles are in different categories, for, for, like, how many maintenance vehicles we have, how many administrative vehicles we have, that sort of thing? Is that later, or? No, I, I didn't go into that detail here, but I do have that. Okay. Can you mark that as a follow-up information that you could give us? Sure. Thank you. Okay. So, Mike, the yeah. uh, jump in insurance, is that the same reason because of the claims? Yes, it is. Okay, and then here's the graphical chart of uh, what's happened with that budget. I mean, you can see between fiscal year 2010 and 2015, uh, that budget has increased about $46,000. Okay, this is what we're looking at for the replacement of service and service vehicles for next year. We have a 1994 Ford Econo van that's got 160,000 miles that the technology department is currently using, and it's starting to cost a lot in repairs to maintain it. We have a 1996 Ford van used for the food services program that's in the catering department, and it has 162,000 miles. We have a 19 or a 2005 Chevrolet Express that's being used for delivery services through uh, the food service program, as well as just the regular transportation, freight shifting things from all between all of the schools. It has 162,000 miles on it. Those are the three vehicles that we're looking at, at replacing for this coming year. Probably two of those three vehicles. Yes. I know we're talking about vehicles, but could we make enough things to address at some point later, perhaps? Why is the school district involved in catering? It's ca the catering program. Let me let me just address it quickly. The catering program is is run through Chartwells, and the money that is made from the catering program through Chartwells offsets a portion of the loss that the food service program generates to the general fund. So if we can subsidize the catering program, if the catering program can make $30,000 in profit, it saves us $30,000 in general fund expenses. Catering to whom? Uh, it would be catering to parent-teacher organization staffs. It could be catering to College of Southern Idaho for events that they have outside. Could be to Blaine County Rec District through the community campus. It could be to all of our meeting functions that we have with Blaine County School District. Could be to weddings that happen in the summertime. Yeah. Competition with all the Not necessarily, no. Most, most of it happens within the school district for things like um, meetings and so forth that take place that, or trainings that take place all day. So if we have people coming in from outside of district to deliver professional development, and it's an all-day deal. Um, sometimes we'll do working lunches through those or breakfasts that are supplied, things like that. Um, it, dinners for the board when, when they're working through um, from 4 o'clock all the way through to a regular board meeting. Um, another good example of that is like a textbook committee when they have uh, teachers as well as people from the public. Those meetings run from like 8 until 5, and they're working the whole time, and they're working through lunch. So that's another opportunity where then there's catering provided for those for those committee meetings. So Chartwell's does the catering. Yes. Money on it, turns it around to the district. Yes. 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 So, so it's beneficial for us to cater with our own vendor in house. in house because we're essentially just covering the cost of the food. At so if we level. if we go outside, then we're not supplementing um, our own food service program. So 
when we spend money with Chartwells, it all comes right back to us. Yeah. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Yeah, and if I was put a, a, an estimate of the percentages, you know, I believe that the catering, catering probably brings in $80,000 a year total. And I know that 90% of that money comes from CSI, the rec district, and the school district. Yeah. The majority of it. It's very little that's outside. Yeah, Have you thought in terms of possibly a set aside for this vehicle through the profitability of the catering operation so that it could be encompassed that way? Six you know, in my mind, in it's it's the same. I mean, if you have revenues that offset the loss in the food service program and you're buying a vehicle for the food service program, mm -hmm. in my mind, it washes out. Because it still comes back to the general fund. It's all. I have it. <laughs> and then what happened to your car? It's over at uh, the uh, transportation department. Okay, meaning our transportation department? Yep. Okay, yep. So, so, and I think, you know, um, when I call around the state, I think we're the only school district to provide uh, vehicles, cars to our, to our admin. And I think that is on a symbolic basis, we should think about how that um, appears. Um, when we have, you know, a, a fraction of the student population of other districts. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. So uh, no, other, no other districts supply uh, transportation for their uh, superintendent? No, not okay. Don, not anything. He, so I can drive my own vehicle and build a district for the mileage. Well, that's what I was just going to add in was yeah, have we done a cost analysis of mileage reimbursement? Because given yeah. the geographic layout of our district being carried to catch them, mileage-wise is how many, Sean? From my house to work is 45 miles. 45 right. miles. And so if you're having a superintendent that's expected to be visiting schools with that geographic sure. distance, would the mileage make, is that a better deal or is owning a car a better deal? Has that well, ever been done before? I actually had that conversation with Mike a couple of years ago uh -huh. um, in looking at that. Because if I drive my own vehicle, then I can put in for the mileage at the mileage rate, right. um, which could actually be profitable for me right. um, if I'm willing to put the own mile the miles on my vehicle, I could actually pocket more cash. So it was one of the things where we were looking at, you know, what, where is that cutoff point? And uh, quite honestly, it's, it's pretty close to a wash. But I, you know, like when I'm going to Boise for Day on the Hill, right. or um, if I'm going to Twin for the Superintendent Region Force conferences, yeah. um, things like that, um, then, you know, those are $200 trips if I'm going to Boise in just mileage reimbursement on my on my vehicle so yeah I, I just want to say just as a, as a um, uh, not even so much symbolic thing but I think I think it's a it's a really important um, accountability um, issue to be able to say you know I, I, I accounted for the miles here 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 and it's and it's and it's it's clear to the public I think that it would make a lot of sense to Go, especially since we're an outlier in this area. Um, the other thing is I know that, you know, the community is, uh, people in the community are aware that, you know, there were brand new vehicles bought after just a few years. And I think that that's more the mentality of your predecessor, maybe, and not, it's part of the change in philosophy, maybe. And some of, some of the older vehicles, uh, like the, the first vehicle that I, was, uh, that I was driving as the assistant superintendent is now a driver's ed car. So they, they tend to move through the fleet. <coughs> and so um, I, that car didn't have a, a lot of miles on it, probably around 60,000, and it went straight into the driver's ed program. And so they kind of work their way down. Um, and they're part of that fleet. So as Kathy just asked, at some point, there's going to be a complete itemized list of every vehicle and its use? Well, he, I believe I've already provided yeah. that to you a few months ago, yeah. yeah. So I, I know I provided yeah. that. I thought it existed, uh, I just was curious to be able to yeah, see that again. Yeah, I remember you asking for it yeah. last year. You know, and to really be truthful, I th there's only a few cars that administrators drive, and it's only the administrators that do a lot of traveling within the district within the day. 
There's a lot of administrators that do not have vehicles. Let's hope so. <laughs> so those administrators that don't have vehicles are taking the mileage? Yes. Yes. Because it doesn't warrant the cost of a vehicle. Yeah, I mean, you've got the data internally to yes. make that. Yes. And, and then I pay the, I pay, I do have to pay taxes on the use of that vehicle. Yeah. So that is a, that is a realized um, benefit under my, under my income. So I, I claim, I have to claim the taxes on the, on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's, well, that, what's the miles gallon that you're getting? Mine gets about 29 miles to the gallon. The Ford, the Ford uh, what is that, Tor, Taurus? It depends on the usage, too. Maintenance operations needs the capacity to haul parts and equipment. So depending on the usage. Do you have a truck? I have a personal truck, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have a school driver truck? No. Okay. Depends on the department and where it's being mm -hmm. used. Okay. Okay. Points of interest, we're going to get into the maintenance department budget here. We have, uh, we, if you look at the next screen, you're going to see that we've, we have a, over a $300,000 decrease over the past five years in utility costs throughout the buildings. We have an insurance decrease. Like I was saying before, if you look back in 2010, 11, and 11, 12, there was a huge decrease in for the insurance services because of the bidding process. Uh, the equipment purchases that they're looking for fiscal year 2014-15 includes two commercial grade vacuums, a propane floor burnisher, and a ride-on machine buffer to be used at Cary School. And here's the uh, maintenance budget for next year as well as the past five years. So, I mean, you can see the impact of the $300,000 in utility savings. And that's McKinstry? Yes. And that's in the form of a guarantee from them? Is that the money statement there? Yes. Okay. And graphically, this is what the chart looks like. That's what we like to see. Mm -hmm. So, previous slide, that insurance cost went down. Well, it went up. Went they up. all went down. I'm looking from 10, 11. Mm -hmm. They all went down. If you look from 10,011, they all went down. But then they just went back up just recently because of the claims. So, well, would this be the same insurance? Yeah, it's, it's very different. Back. This, this yeah. would be property, casualty, and liability insurance here. So it could be, yes. For example, the, the accident that we had where the student got hit with a pencil, this would be reflected in this category because it didn't have anything to do with vehicles. <laughs> got hit with a pencil. Yeah, a student yeah, poked another student in the eye with a pencil and caused retinal damage. We were in a lawsuit recently. Oh. 3,300 students we have things happen. <laughs> okay, for 14, uh, fiscal year 14-15, for the non-occupied, non-student occupied site maintenance, we're looking at to replace the sewer line at the Hemingway Elementary School. We have some pavers at Bellevue and Haley Elementary so need some additional sand bedding. Uh, we have uh, isolated portions of curbs, gutters, and sidewalks at the middle school, high school, Haley, Woodside, and the district office that needs to be replaced. So, and this is that budget. So the budget to maintain those items will be $85,000 for next year, or it's requested at $85,000. Typically, it's only a one-year warranty on that type of stuff. And it depends also what I guess would be on the cause, whether it was damage due to negligence or something else. Yeah, like a snow plow or a insulation. Yeah, it just depends on the cause. Broken water main. <laughs> Broken water main, yeah. 
Okay, for the student occupied building maintenance program, contracted services include copier maintenance agreements, pest controls, fire alarm maintenance agreements, and contracted repairs if we had to hire electricians to come out or plumbers to come out or different types of things that would be covered under the contracted maintenance. Supplies would include the parts and materials for the repairs of the existing systems within the buildings. Uh, building components that we're looking at for this coming year would be in the five-year maintenance plan. We're looking at uh, moving the SRO office at Wood River High School to the front of the office instead of back in the back. What does that stand for? The school mm -hmm. resource officer. The police officer. The police officer. <laughs> the, ar the armed officers in the building. Okay. They're looking at doing, uh, including a door into the counseling area at Wood River High School. We're looking at some roof repairs at Bellevue Elementary School. We're looking at Cary Art Room ref to refloor the art room in Cary. We're looking for high temperature sensors in the freezers and the walk-in coolers. So if a compressor goes out, it'll send out an alarm to Howie so we don't have uh, food that gets spoiled. Uh, and from what else I put in here for a complete list of the five-year maintenance plan, look at the district website under the finance department because you'll see a very comprehensive list of things that, that we believe need to be taken, over, taken care of over the next five years. And this is just a small portion of those items that need to be done. And it would be all done, all of that list of items, some of it would be included in the school plant facility fund, but the majority of it will not be. It would be dependent on the general fund at this point in time. Yes? I'm assuming those top items, the same copy or maintenance, pest control, fire alarm, et cetera, all go out to bid? The pest control, yes. The fire alarm, uh, no, because there's only one fire alarm maintenance company here in town, Sentinel. Uh, the so copier. Sorry, how often are these done, fire alarm maintenance? So is it possible to entertain a bid from someone outside of Bellman? Well, there are, there are multiple entities. We have a company that comes in and does what they call an NFPA 72, and they go through and assess the whole building, and they're not at Sentinel. Sentinel does the monitoring, but they also do other components for us also. So there's probably three different companies that actually are involved with all of the systems at, at different, different levels. Okay. But so none of them Sentinel monitors 24-7, so they've always used Sentinel, and they'll call, they'll always call us until they find somebody. They don't send out a text, they don't send out an email. So they have somebody sent in front of a monitor all the time. So we feel that that's pretty important for all the systems that we have. And no other shocking at all, does that? Nothing at all. There is an email. That's my question. Can I have experience with them at work, and it's... Yeah. Alarm star? The Alarm ones. star? Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's another company in town. I've not been solicited by anybody else to provide the services. But maybe we should be soliciting this. <laughs> there is another company outside of Sentinel in the Valley. Um, Sun Valley Company has been using them. Um, personally, I have not been impressed by their service and the change that we receive from Sentinel as compared to what we're receiving now at Sun Valley they Company. They are new, like within the last year or two. Um, they've been at Sun Valley Company for the last three years, I believe. Mike, how come uh, these issues wouldn't come out of the maintenance levy? I'm just wondering how come this would come mm -hmm. out of the general fund and not the maintenance levy? Because, because this is all uh, maintenance agreement type services. Okay. All of the levy is new construction type or repair of existing buildings. And just really quick, one last question. I'm, I'm getting confused where we stand with the um, SRO officers in the district. How many, we, where are we, you know, we have one, we have area. one officer that, that we currently fund, one position that we fund through Haley Police Department. So that position has been in the district a long time. Back when I was a teacher, that was Dennis Haynes. He was the retired uh, sheriff here in town, and he was the first SRO at the high school in the old building, which is now the community campus. So that was always a, a, a district position. Then we moved it to an actual 
police officer um, with Manny Ornalis at the high school when I was the VP there and contracted with um, Haley PD. Um, we wanted full um, control of that position to make sure that they were at our uh, discretion as opposed to the police department's discretion. So we pay the salary through Haley PD. They're not in a Blaine County District employee. He's actually employed by um, Haley PD, but we contract with Haley PD for that service. The SRO at the middle school was provided to us through the Sheriff's Department um, on a grant 12 years ago through PAL and DARE programming. And so that's been soft money. The Sheriff's Department has always maintained that position full time at the middle school. So that is not a Blaine County position and we do not fund it. So currently due to cuts that they've experienced, they've had to pull that position back and, and are using it more in a patrol capacity. Um, and they did come to me and talk to me, but it's not, it's not our position. We don't control the, the, um, the salary. We don't control, we don't pay for any of that service. So it's really their position mm -hmm. and where they choose to put it. Mm -hmm. So Gene Ramsey pulled that back. We're in, in currently in talks with them on how we can restore that or what we can do or what partnerships we can, can uh, align with to try and return that um, security to the middle school. But right now, Chad Schurmeyer, Officer Schurmeyer, is employed by the Sheriff's Office. They've pulled him off of that post to serve in a different capacity. Um, Haley PD has stepped in and given us some additional hours from their officers to cover in the meantime while we're trying to get this figured out. But if the school district wanted to replace Chad, that would be at our cost, which was not in the budget prior. So that's, that's something up for Thanks for explaining that because discussion. it was muddy for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. He's a he's a, a an officer of the Haley Police Department. And does Idaho state law allow anyone else to be armed, administrators or teachers? No. Not on public school property. It has to be a, an armed officer. No, he's actually an employee of the Haley Police Department. But he's subject to the our assignment. Your assignment. So the rules he's We control his schedule and his payroll is run through Haley Police Department. Gotcha, and then you're just reimbursing. Yes. Okay. Yep. But in terms of the rules that he's dealing with are subject to what Blaine County School District deems appropriate. Yes. But if there's a law broken, yeah. he's also an officer. So, um, so it's a little bit of a moving target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's how most school districts deal with SROs. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, some big school districts actually have their own police departments. So like if you go to Orange County in Florida, they actually employ 25 officers, cars, guns, the whole nine yards, but they're actually employed by the school district and they have their own police department. So um, we contract, like a lot of school districts, with a police department in our jurisdiction, just like Boise School District does. Um, so he's, a, he's an officer of Haley PD. Um, however, we control the schedule. Um, we don't use them during the summer. So it basically helps them supplement an officer during that time. But then we get full control during the school year um, to his assignment. Um, he operates under our jurisdiction. He's there on our behalf. So we run the searches. We do those things. But if we find something or a law has been broken, then he can enter into that situation as a Haley Police Department officer. And who's, who would his direct supervisor be? His direct supervisor is both Pete Jurovich at the high school, the principal of the high school, but, but more importantly is actually the, the chief of police at Haley Police Department. Because that's, their jurisdiction is that, that school. So if there was an incident, Haley PD would be the incident command if there was a, um, an emergency situation. Before we proceed, I just want to do a time check. We're about halfway through our time allotment and uh, about see how far we are through our presentation. Okay. Okay, so here's the actual budget for the student occupied building maintenance for the past five years. This is what it looks like graphically. 
What are building components? Yeah, I was just going to You go back building, to the... Can you go back one slide? Yep. Building components would be uh, the five-year maintenance plan. You know, we talked about the site improvements. The five-year maintenance plan would be the building components, like the inside remodeling of the high school, the SRO office coming out, cutting the doorway in, those types of things would all be under the building components. And what's the travel budget for? The travel budget would be for uh, maintenance, the maintenance crews if they're going out for out-of-district travel, or Mr. Royal if he's going out-of-district travel, or if they have, they wouldn't have in-district mileage, but mostly it's for out-of-district registration for conferences that they're going to, or trainings that they're going to, or certifications that they have to receive. Okay. Okay. Okay, the grounds budget. Now this is for all of the landscaping snow removal type stuff. So the landscaping budget you'll see on the next slide where it has been increased this year and it's because it, it's been continually overspent for the past several years. We were at the point where we were having uh, principals and coaches and other type of people calling the landscaping company and telling them to do an extra mowing for a soccer game or a football game or a baseball game or you know any types of those things uh, and he was doing that in charging the school district so we've got that all under control now to where they're only allotted one mowing per week they can schedule that mowing whenever they feel like they need it the most and anything additional from that would come out of their own athletic budgets of those schools that are requesting it we're not saying you can't do it we're just saying if you want that and they do that and they charge you for it, then it's coming out of your budget to try to eliminate that. Okay? And that's kind of what uh, this comment here is in reference to. The controls that we put in place on who's going who's gonna to be authorized to make those additional mowings and repairs. You know, we had a lot of issues with uh, organizations and groups and student groups going out and planting trees someplace and it always had a conflict with the existing sprinkler system. So then we would have to redesign the sprinkler system and move sprinklers around so it didn't damage the trees or the sheds or things like that and it was just costing additional money to do that. So we're trying to get all of that back under control. Okay, and we've set up some clear guidelines on the role of the landscape company during the summertime and also the role of our student labor employees that we hire through the summertime for the grounds department. There's some things that they do very well, the grounds crew, the small the students, and there's some things that they do not do real well, like bed maintenance and those types of things. They don't do that very well. They just they don't like to do that. So what, what we ended up happening last year was is before uh, graduation and before you know the start of new school we had to hire the landscaping company to come in and maintain those beds and fix all of that stuff to where the appearance was nice so this year what we did is we only assigned the duties for those grounds crew students on tasks that we felt like that they could complete like weed whacking you know the native areas and things like that everything else we've uh, said that Clearwater is going to maintain for us and just to the point of clarification, do we bid that every year? Or is it a three-year contract, and how is that handled? Typically, it's a five-year contract because those contracts are so expensive to maintain. Those contractors want some assurance that they're going to have it year after year. But we do, uh, we do have escape clauses or out clauses on an annual basis. So we, even if we did sign a five-year agreement with a landscaping contractor, we would always have that out every year okay. if they weren't performing the way we felt they just should be the equipment that they're looking at purchasing this coming year is a new tool cat with a snowblower attachment that's the, the the big drivable snow removal equipment does the whites sidewalks sidewalks and those types of things and then they're also looking at a walk behind snowblower they, they replace about one of those every year for the schools. Do those, does that tool cat 
Is that supposed to zoom around to all the schools on a snow day, or how does that work? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And now, yeah. Now, what are you using? Big part, same, same okay. Type of okay. Okay. It's just old. And yeah, we yeah. Well, we currently have two of those. I think we have two two of those toolkits. Three of those toolkits. So you were talking about a contract with Clearwater. I thought you mentioned they did snow removal. No. They do parking lots, not grounds, not parking the sidewalks. Lots, not sidewalks. Grounds, sidewalks, etc. Are then in. Yes. Okay. So here's here's our budgets for the past five years on the grounds department. The snow removal has been pretty consistent. We've had a pretty good year on snow removal. We didn't spend nearly that whole budget. The landscaping, you can see the landscaping jump from the last couple of years, but it's been consistent that we've been spending anywhere from three hundred and thirty to three hundred and eighty thousand dollars. We've actually signed, we've actually have contracts for the coming year with, with Clearwater not to exceed those dollar amounts and any kind of an additional mowings or requests from those other staff members or principals or schools will be charged back to the school so we can monitor that. Oh, so this is all primarily lawn mowing? Uh, it's lawn mowing, sprinkler repairs, uh, monitoring of the sprinkler systems, uh, cleaning of the beds, maintaining, it's maintaining all outside of the buildings. Top dressing for athletic fields, um, weed control. Is all of this standard lawn that requires a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer and insecticides and all of that stuff? The question is, has anybody ever thought about um, a actually, one of the reasons we saw a big increase there is we, we tried to go more organic and use clove oil on a lot of our weeds, which then encroached upon some of our facilities like tracks and so forth, which caused uh, irreparable damage that we had to go in and, and redo. So um, I can tell you that a lot of those natural uh, ways of, of, that are non-evasive um, also are more expensive. So I mean, there's there's a lot you got to weigh out when you're looking at doing things necessarily different that you think are better. There can be some serious costs that accompany that. I was just thinking about natural grasses, drought tolerance, plantings, all those sorts of things that mm -hmm. over the long run would cut down mm -hmm. on all the maintenance. Mm -hmm. Barbara, a lot of the green space that are around our schools are playgrounds at the elementary levels um, for the kids as well as athletic fields. And so we're talking soccer fields and baseball fields and, soccer and football. And so that green space is very important for those activities and for, those, for the kids to play on. Oh, I was just talking, I'm just talking about maybe a different type of grass. Oh. That didn't require yeah. expensive there, there are native areas that surround the And, and we, do, we don't use, you know, evasive chemicals on play areas. Mm. I mean, that's something that we keep off of the actual play areas. But those surrounding areas that encroach upon some of those areas, um, that's where we run into trouble because even though you're using clove oil on the, on the play surface, those, those noxious weeds can, or any other weeds, can, they, they slowly encroach upon that. And so if you don't keep them out there, then you're re trying to repair later, um, and it can... They can do a lot of damage pretty quick. It's pretty amazing. When I was talking to Matt <clears throat> and looking at our grounds and going around and seeing the encroachment of some of those um, weed issues that were coming from outside the playing fields but are now encroaching on those play areas, um, then how do you get them out of there mm -hmm. once they take over? So. There, you know, there are additional ways you could do that instead of a broadcast fertilizer. You can have the, the guys carry a backpack type fertilizer, but the cost of, of labor to apply the fertilizer that way instead of a broadcast all at once with a tractor was about an additional $60,000 a year for that kind of an application instead of a broadcast. So we did look at all of those things. You've even looked at goats. I mean. <laughs> They we're, not, we're, not opposed, we're not opposed to thinking outside the box. Yeah. I think it's great. They use goats in Jamaica. 
Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we're moving into the technology budget. Uh, we just we signed an agreement with uh, Syringa Wireless. We renegotiated the contract with them. We increased the bandwidth for a very, uh, I think it was five times, is that right, Tim? Five times the bandwidth for a very minimal increase in the cost that we were paying. Uh, this coming year, we're looking at uh, splitting up the software site licenses between two different accounts, one for instructional software and one for infrastructural software. Uh, the site license account has been continually over budget for the past several years. So what we want to do is start monitoring those uh, licenses to where we can get a good handle on what we're actually utilizing and what we're not utilizing. So we can eliminate some things that, that we're not utilizing or there's a better software that we have in-house that will replace it. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about. Uh, we're, we, we purchase three new copiers every year and have every school on a rotation basis where they get a new copier every three years. Those copiers that they have existing in the building, what they do is they have them refurbished and they use them for backup or a second copier in the buildings. And for example, when the district office or the technology department or Silver Creek Alternative School that doesn't do a lot of volume on their copiers, we'll refurbish it and we'll put it in another department like the maintenance or the community campus or you know, one of the other, bus shop, one of those facilities. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know anything about copiers, but is that pretty common to, you know, get new ones every three years? Do they break down easily, or is that the reason for that that they start breaking down? Or after after three years at the high school, after three years, that copier will have eight hundred thousand copies on it. Mm -hmm. And it'll get very close to the useful life on those. I mean, we could lease them, but we're not going to save any money leasing them because of the cost per copy on a lease is, is very expensive compared to the cost per purchase. So is that how it works? The, the life of a copier is about how many copies it makes? Typically 1.3 to 1.5 million copies. <coughs> and, and what we do is we cover these copiers on a maintenance agreement copier maintenance agreements where it covers all of the cost of the repairs of those copiers over a three-year period of time. And the only thing we pay is for paper, paper and staples. Everything else is covered under the maintenance agreement. And those maintenance agreements cost are about six tenths, six point five tenths of one cent per copy. So it's less than a cent. No, it's out of Twin Falls. Yeah. Has it ever been bid? So we're pushing yes. it based on that. We look at that every year. Could, could you explain to me the third item on that? <laughs> the site licenses regarding? Yeah. I'm, I, I'm just a little confused. Why. Last year, what we did is we took a part of the site license budget from the general fund and pushed it over to the plant facility fund to, for those maintain when we were maintaining security types of programs and those things that were being paid for out of the school plant facilities fund. This year we've shifted that all back to the general fund. And when you talk about the site license account, you're talking about Blaine County, all the schools operating under one account, correct? One considered one site. one site license account. Right. No, not necessarily one site, because we do have sites In other words, that encompasses everybody. Is the individual schools are each considered individual sites. No, okay. not necessarily. Only if they had a a separate software license agreement that, that nobody other schools did, they would be. Mm -hmm. But typically, we have license agreements that covers the entire district. So, for example, at the high school and the, and the alternative school, we use Novanet, which is a, a credit recovery um, license, sure, but that is specific to the high school and, and the alternative school. So some are site-specific to the school, some are district-wide. And if they're district-wide and they're, you know, for software that's being used throughout the state, is there any option of being able to group in with the entire 
entire state under a site licensing mm -hmm. agreement? Mm -hmm. No. No, in fact, the state's going the other way. So they have some licensure through the state, such as SchoolNet, yeah. that they are dropping and now giving the money back to the local districts and allowing us to purchase our own products. So instead of the state driving it at this point, they're actually going the other way because most people don't like the product that the state has chosen for us, and they would rather have the money and choose their own. So um, that, was, that just came through JFAC. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the school budget, but one of the items that they held back was that exact um, issue on school mat, was that they asked um, if we wanted that, them to take care of that for a data reporting system or if we wanted to purchase our own. So they decided that uh, most school districts, 90% of us, did not like the product that they had purchased and spent several million on and would rather have the money in our own coffers so that we could purchase a product that we were confident in. And school net, is that what it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that was developed? Uh, that was developed by a company that, the, I'm not sure which company developed that. It's Pearson. Pearson. So the Pearson developed that and the state purchased that for all schools. Um, but most schools decided to spend their own money on different programs even though they got it free from the state. That's how confident they were in it. The good news is we're going to get the money back to purchase our own. Which we don't have to purchase. Okay. So this is what the budgets look like for the technology department in the past five years. And like I said, the details behind all of these numbers are all on the, inter on the website right now. So you can go there and look and see what that each of those entails. So the website yes. will say who, who we lease the fiber from, what S company? Syringa, Syringa Wireless, yes. Oh, you said Syringa, okay. So is that? Right. And you stated that the site license increase was because of the, how it was being budgeted before it was in the levy and now it's being put back in the m and budget? Yes. So is it an actual increase, or is it just a transference of where it's being funded it's, through? It's actually a transfer of where it's been funded in the past. Okay. But the, you know, the more software license or software that we purchase, that we get within the district, like for example, if we if we decided to start purchasing textbook software instead of the actual textbooks, mm -hmm. these numbers are going to actually increase. And we have. And we have. Yeah. So, like you, I see copiers expense is the same year after year, but that does not include the maintenance agreements you just spoke about. Right? That is correct. That's the so actual. Just buying new copiers. Yes, that would be in the purchase services. Um, that maintenance agreement. I would like to question whether that's really necessary. That many copiers. The copiers. dollars every year. That's three copiers. Uh, I know, and you just talked about, anyway, it might be something that could be thought about. Mm -hmm. We could lease them and pay the same amount, and it would be covered under purchase services. No, I'm just talking about maybe making them last a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You know, we typically have run those copiers for seven or eight years before we actually get rid of them, before they, they're, just, they're just completely thrown away. Because we always rotate, after the first three years, you, we refurbish and rotate it back in for an additional three years. And then after six years, depending on the quality of the copier, it would be pushed back down to one of the departments or another department that doesn't utilize them as much. And equipment has nothing there for this year, so... Because all of the equipment budget coming out of this year is coming out of the plant facility levy. Why is that? Because that's what the taxpayers voted on when they passed the levy. But that wasn't the case the last two years? I mean, two years there was... There was only $1,200 vote or levied in 2012-13 and 1800 last year. Why the 51 and the 
Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So why? Because the 51000 actually the $50,000 is a portion of that. We used to have some technology money that we put out to the schools. And it was always on a per pupil basis to give access to technology money to the schools. And we had a $50,000 budget that was based on a per student basis. And we shifted that money from the general fund to the school plant facility fund between those two years. As well as, if you look in 2010-11, we did the same thing there. Because originally it was $100,000 and we shifted 50 one year and 50 the next year. Mm. So your, your tech equipment falls under the school plant facility fund technology purchases? Yes. This year. Right. Well, and in the last couple Every of years, year, too. Every year, last few yeah. years, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think just philosophically it gets confusing because people are seeing a, an expense for technology that's gone on and then all of a sudden was switched into the, to the levy, but it was, not, it was a regular cost of business expense. And I think that the way people thought about the levy was that this was something that would pay for new stuff. It wasn't. Um, it was new stuff. It, yeah, well, it, it is wasn't. New stuff. No, you look but, at it, but the I'm, I'm saying for all the high school students and, and carry the the one to one I pilots have. that they're doing at the high school. The yeah. technology that the additional technology has been able to come in through that plant facilities levy so, that would not have been available with that current. So when I, and I, so I guess yeah, and I, I hear I I understand what you're saying, but when I I. I understand what you're saying too. So you, there's these numbers that are going up and down wildly from 2010 to 2015. And for example, it went in the opposite way for, um, uh, for equipment, but then, then it did for the site licenses. And what I'm not understanding is why that was. If, if, the, if the plant facilities levy is passed and we started to reap the the, the money coming in, why why are those going up so much in the site li site licenses and then down so much um, on the equipment? It just seems like stuff is getting moved around, and I'm not understanding it. The site licenses the site licenses are really controlled. A lot of it's from like Microsoft. The more technology you have the more site licenses you have to purchase for that technology, which is going to drive up the cost of that. A lot of that money, or a portion of that money, is actual licenses for all of the Microsoft things that we have within the district. Mm -hmm. So that's going to drive the cost. The more technology you have, the more that's increased. The more Promethean boards that you have, the more site licenses are going to increase to license that software. And that I get, that would be, to my mind, it, that would be covered by the, the levy, right? I mean. That's why I'm not understanding. In one case, the levy's covering it. In another case, it's not. I'm just confused. Maybe I, yeah. is it, it, it sounds as though you've got a good amount of discretion in terms of where you put the budgeted items right. from year to year or between years, am I mistaken? No, I don't think so. I think uh, in the equipment budget, I would say. Well, I'm looking at equipment and the site licenses. You mm -hmm. said that the site license was over in one, and now it's back. Mm -hmm. and the that's what I'm saying. I think there that, that that's what probably the is the confusion and yeah. I'm wondering if it's discretionary on your part as far as where you are able to allocate those dollars. Yeah, good. No, not necessarily, because it uh, equipment when we passed the plant facility levy, that was part of the levy itself, was to allocate all of the technology purchases from that point on to the school plant facility fund. As a follow-up question to that, Mike, before we go on. So it, it passed in 2010. Yes. But yet we it, still spent almost $200,000 in 2010 in our M&O rather than in the facility budget. Correct. And then it reduced significantly the next year, and now it's pretty much nothing. So why was that a tapering rather than a, okay, we have the facility levy, zero it now and put it all over there? Was there can you explain that? Well, a portion of it was the technology grants that we allocated back to the schools, like I said, the yeah. 50, 50,000 of the 51,200 uh -huh. was those technology funds that the general fund distributed out to the schools. And that was all before purposes. the levy was passed, that those started? Yes. 
Okay, so that was just a carryover from budgeting before the levy even yes. came into existence. Yeah. And then the 1218, which is nominal, that was just, there is to cover anything that might not fit under the levy? Is that why that was there? It, it could have been, I, 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 I'm just, I just don't know the specifics of it. Uh -huh. I mean, it could have been, you know, that the technology department wanted two printers or three printers, or I don't know. Okay, and then why did we move the site license portion from the mm -hmm. plant, did you say we moved that from the being paid out of the plant facility back into the M&O, or is that just compensating for the how much it went over budget in previous years? It, it's, a, it's a combination of both of those. Okay. Last year, in order to keep the general fund at the, at the target we wanted to maintain as the budget increase, okay. we shifted some of those expenditures from the site licenses back to the school plant facility fund. Okay, and that may be what you were referring to, Kirk, as far as some discretion between those two. Okay, keep if going. If you look at past year's history on how much has been spent on those site licenses, it's been pretty consistent that it's been substantially over the 250 to 270 range. And it will be again this year. I mean, those the numbers that Tim has budgeted for the site license there are his projections of what those amounts are going to cost next year. That's not to say that we won't do that again mm -hmm. when we get into May, when we start looking at the cost of what this whole budget looks like. We may make that decision to shift some of those monies back, but right now it's in the general fund. Okay, so we have that discretion. Can I ask Tim a question really quick? What kind of auditing do you do to verify the validity of a site license when you go to renew it as far as the usefulness of that license? A lot of times buildings will come and they'll say that they need this software and then we're digging a little deeper to see are they actually using it. So they said they needed it, they came, they wanted the budget, they wanted it budgeted, they wanted it purchased, but are we getting the bang for the buck? And that's, that's a question that, that we've been asking and we're looking into. So we want to make sure that we're getting the bang out of those dollars and if we're not, then we want to reevaluate whether we want to continue those licenses. Just, yeah, Liz? Yeah, just really, uh, so... Um, uh, so how much did we spend on technology from to the beginning of the levy, 2010, to now? I'm just trying to see, you know, we've gone from... you remember that number that I, we were talking about two, a couple weeks ago? Was it? In terms of how much, we, how much was the entire technology budget in, say, 2010? Now, how yes. much we've how spent much today? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. the entire, the entire well, technology budget was well, about uh, $9.8 million. Over the last period of time, or one year? For the 10 years. That's how much was allotted. That was allotted for the levy. Well, I mean, yeah. 10 million was allotted, but you're asking yeah. how much of that 10 million has been spent. Correct. Thus far. Oh, okay. That, that question. I think oh, it was okay. like. Did you say, I want to say 5.2. I think it was right around $5 million. Right. So what we also have to look at is how much have we spent now, and we're four years into the levy, we have six years left, and how much do we have left? And how much are we going to allocate per year and trying to hit those targets right. to where we don't a lot of this stuff was front-loaded, the technology. Right. Yeah, and I think that we're all, you know, realizing that technology has a huge part to play in our kids' education. But sometimes when you flood a whole bunch of money into an area and you, it wasn't, it, I, I, I got the, I, the, the impression that it wasn't um, very well thought out, that amount. I just want to make sure that we're not spending money um, and then it comes back to haunt us in terms of repair of equipment and that kind of thing because sometimes a flood of money can create more more damage than and cause more damage than um, solve problems. So that's that's where I've been leery of a lot of this, and I'm really glad that you're looking into the site licenses. That's a I mean that's an obvious thing that just has exploded, um, and then the entire budget has exploded. And I know you don't have extra you have you're down on employees so I think a lot of the hardware is languishing and I just want to make sure this was a huge huge bottom line number that we've spent in the last five years I just want to really really be careful not to just spend what's in the budget because it's there Angie had her hand raised next okay um, 
Mike, I wanted to say one of the things that I think is not clear by looking at these numbers because of that ability to shift the cost or the expense of size licenses or equipment or other things between our M&O and the plant facility is what was the total technology budget if you were to not have it in M&O or in plant facility and you put it all together, how much were we spending? And has that gone up? Has it been pretty flat line? Has it gone down? Were there special purchases that were made that because we uh, obtained the levy that would be kind of outside of normal operating uh, costs yes. for technology? Right. And that's not really clear by this. And so maybe that's something that we could do as a follow-up. Did yeah. the to clarify, I think that's kind of what you were yeah, asking, did, isn't did it? The levy, is the levy draining some of our money off of, you know, yeah. the uh, M and O? I mean, I think the the levy has given us the ability way. to buy purchases that we wouldn't have been able to afford before, as well as maybe, you know, we've got that ability because of that those funds. But it's still not clear to me what's the real budget as far as the standard operating technology costs. Does that make sense, what I just said? Yeah. Um. Can you clarify something for me? What? Talking about the levy funds. I only know basically what I read in the newspaper about the whole meeting of the levy and how it works. It was my understanding that levy money would be taken from the taxpayers only if and when it was needed. And yet now, my side of that is being shifted over there, shifted over there, shifted over there from the general fund right. as if it's kind of an extra little slush fund over here to be dipped into whenever. And I would like to see as many things as possible, including this equipment for this year, paid for out of the general fund so it's obvious, as you said, yeah. exactly. It's all here. And the levy fund touched only, well, it's already been touched so often that maybe it shouldn't be well, I think Mike can answer this a little bit better, but I'm going to take a little stab at it from what I know in, in having these conversations. One of the significant differences, as he alluded to before, is that we're trying to keep the M&O level. But the, the M&O budget, the general fund budget, the general fund budget level, okay? But our revenues coming in from the state have gone this way. And so in order to maintain that, we have the plant facility levy that allows us for, to purchase these technologies. Our technology needs have gone through the roof because technology is increasing at a dramatic rate. The usefulness of that technology in the classroom for students is essential and is proven to be a fantastic resource that we have here. So being able to put those expenses into that, keeping our general fund level and actually using what that fund was put out to the taxpayers for was technology. And so by being able to buy Chromebooks, by being able to put in uh, laptops and iPads in the classrooms and having Prometheans in each room, that's a huge asset to our district. We would not have been able to do that without that levy because we would have had to scale back because our general fund was actually decreasing because the state is giving us less money every year. So it's not a slush fund. It's definitely not a such fund. It's, it's essential items. Um, now, there has been some flexibility as to how we're going to expense that out. But, but I'd like to see the, the option would have been we don't do it, well, period. Well, Mike, do you want to expand on me, my answer? Let me put that into perspective. The unappropriated balances for the entire district is $14 million. The majority portion of that is the plant facility levy. The general fund only makes up a small portion of that. If you start shifting these type of expenditures into the general fund, the district's going to be in a supplemental override levy situation in two years. Two years. If we hired 20.7 FTE next year, we would be in a supplemental levy situation in two years. You mean you would have to go back to the taxpayers and ask for 
and yeah. Yes, exactly. Right, and the other on top of on top of plant facility load. Yeah, and that's Barbara, what we're trying to conserve. One other thing to consider is that if you look at the state of districts around the around our state, most of them are operating on a supplemental level levy. They have to have a supplemental levy just to do their day to day business. Actually, we don't want to get into that position. Spending. Pardon me. Most of them are on a deficit, deficit budget. spending. Yeah. And so we're trying to preserve the fact that we're able to absorb that decrease in funding from the state by using this facility levy, by redu reducing our costs, by um, you know just being good stewards. And so it's not a slush fund. And we would not be able to have many of the things that we've talked about in our board meetings if that fund was not there with the different programming that we have and the different um, resources that we have in our district just would not be there. So yeah, we could we could do that and you could go back and you can take all the computers out of the high school and you could take the iPads out and and you would reduce your site licenses and you would reduce no, that. I'm not yeah. I'm asking that everybody though stop shifting back and forth. Yeah. I guess what we're trying to do is, is, yeah. is we have this, this general fund balance, the, the one that you're uh, referring to, which makes up the difference in the loss of revenue from the state. And even as the state replaces it back, their plan is to replace the 28% um, percent that they've cut since 2006 by 2017. So what they're saying is they'll have us back to 2007 funding levels in 2017. So we'll be 10 years behind. So they're going to get us back to where we were in 2007 in 2017. And what's going to keep us, what's going to keep us, as we spend that down, it's going to keep us solvent. But that's, our, that's the only account that keeps us above water until we get to that point. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we watch our spending that we do not overspend, that we're cutting those budgets back. If you look at our M&O levy, if you look at our M&O spending, our, our general fund balance, it's been the same since about 2008. So we're trying to keep as level as we can and not spend more money, cut back on FTE, make sure we're not spending more money than we have in the past so that we can make that last as long as we possibly can so we're not back in front of the voters. We don't want to be back in front of the voters asking for more money. So we've got to make that stretch as far as we possibly can. And that means we do have to be very responsible about how we use that money. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, and I, I'm, I'm, I apologize that I'm going to have to leave, but I just uh, wanted to say the budget stabilization provides us with a huge extra amount of money that all the other don't get. And I feel strongly that we should be able to keep our expenses within that amount. It's not extra money, it's 65% of our M&O. No, that's, that's, it's extra according to other um, districts, do you not get that, right? I mean, it's extra, I'm saying when you're comparing to other districts. I'm sorry, Mr. Moore. Well, then we'd have to cut three quarters of our staff and pay them $30,000 a year. I was the one that went down, and all I'm saying is to talk about some of the money we have three times more than other districts with the, the um, budget stabilization is not something that I think tentatively we can so do you believe we could operate on the state funding alone? We've got about five minutes left, and, and we can have this uh, conversation said extra. About, about state funding and, and stabilization. I agree. We do not want to be out in front of the, the public asking for additional money. We are extremely fortunate to be able to have the funds that we do, and we need to learn how to tighten our belts. One of the, the blessings that we have is a very experienced staff. It's a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. Blessing because of the quality, curse because of the funds mm -hmm. needed to, to afford those salaries. 
So what that might Yeah, be. and just to clear this up, fiscal year 1415 site licenses, that was my way of saying let's make this pure. Let's keep all of the technology replacement money in the plant facility long, in the plant facility levy where we promised it was going to be. And that's the way we would clean it up. It was the one year that it happened, 1314. It didn't happen the prior years, and it didn't happen in 1415. So that's my way of saying, general fund, this is probably your responsibility. Let's maintain it. Great. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So here's the expenditures on that for the. Okay, we're going to get into the individual departments here. So here's the curriculum department. I think we can go through these a little quicker. So you can see the department budgets, the curriculum department budget has pretty, been pretty stable the last five years. Okay, graphically that's what it looks like. What's the big jump from 2010 to 2011? Well, you're looking at small numbers here. It's $1,000 in 2010 and $14,000 in, two in yeah. 2011. So there is a huge graphically difference between those two. Right. What was the reason? I mean, if you can remember. I don't know. I'd have to go back four years and look at the budget to see what, what that was for. Math book and tech. Math tech. How does the uh, textbook... I mean, that's in a different category. It's in a different category. What about adoptions? That's it's in a different, in different category. Categories. We'll get into that. Okay. What about the travel for training for ID? It's in a separate category. We still got to come. Okay. It's, it's coming. Okay. This is only the travel related to the curriculum director. Okay. Okay. Oh. So in 11, 12, they traveled a lot. Not so much. Okay. Or they requested travel a lot. Yeah. Not necessarily did they spend it all. Yeah. That was budget. That was budgeted about. Okay. Okay. So we're, now we're going to get into the instructional improvement. This would be the textbook adoption and all of the in-service accounts. So my statement is the textbook adoptions can, can vary quite a bit depending on which textbooks, which subjects are going to be adopted. You'll see that coming up. In this coming year, these are what's included in the in-service budgets. Oh, that needs to be and for a, if you want to go to the website, and I have a five-year history of all curriculum type in-service budgets that's happened for the last five years. And you can see how, for example, the math mapping support this year compared to what was requested last year, the prior year, the year before that, if it was even done that. Okay. So. I just really want to say that when I've looked at all the budgets over the years, the last five or six years are all level, but they totally skyrocketed in the previous ten. So I don't think it's fair to compare it to the last five years because you're just going to see jump, 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 jump in the last ten years. So it's like, oh, we're looking level, but that's just the last five or six years. And I can supply you my Excel sheets that show that. It's just skyrocketing in the last ten or fifteen years. And then it levels off. It levels off about three times higher than it was. So I think that should be kept in mind. You know, at that point in time, we were adding 12 to 15 positions a year, trying to keep up with the growth parent the demand that there was being placed on the school district. And the majority of those increases in those budgets was staff related. 85% of the budget is staff related. Well, I noticed that that. that Incline was in every single department except facility. It's the only one that didn't increase. The others increased like 200, 300 percent. And I guarantee and I it's all school. it's all staff and benefits. No, it's, it's it's all the programs. It's administration. It's landscaping. It's it's not just staff at all. It's every single line item. But I staff have it all out in the Excel yeah. sheets. Staff is. Enrollment's been pretty steady for the last five years. But before that, it was increasing? You know, yeah. from what other boards have done five years ago and 10 years ago and 15 years ago, I don't think it's fair to argue that now. Well, just to compare what we could be spending, because if we spent half 10 years ago that we're spending now, the fact that it's level the last four years isn't full information. There, there's a lot more programs. I mean, 
And I mean, you look at what we've done. Yeah. You look at what we've done as a district. I mean, if you'd, if you'd seen last month's presentation, you would have seen that we were 188 positions over what the state funds us for. 188 positions, that accounts for $15 million. Now, if we were going to get rid of that, you would be looking at 40 kids in a classroom. You, you would be looking at no PE teachers, no music, no art. Fear mongering. I don't believe it, Mike. I don't believe it. I'm going to get those Excel sheets out and okay. give them to the board. Let's go ahead and do this. Yeah. If you look at 15 years ago and the number of students and the money spent and compare it to now, I'm not just talking about students, but the number of students and academic standards. I've done it for cost of living expenses. Everything is at least twice as much, even including cost of living expenses over the last 15 years. Double per student, per student expenditures. I'll get them, I'll get the information in the chart for them. You know, I don't think anybody's arguing with that at all. I I understand that, but I'm saying that there's reasons for that. Anytime we're trying to keep up with the cost of living with our own staff to maintain staff here, we have to see above the cost of living to our staff increases. Just what happened for the last five years, we didn't have any control on that. We got just, caught in that high. Just the cost of benefits one year in medical benefit costs went up 15% in one of those years. Mm -hmm. um, and those are costs that, that's not even an addition to any staff members or anything like that, but it's a cost in supplying those benefits to staff, which do make up 85% of our budget. Not to, their, not to the staff member's health benefit. They have to purchase it for their families. So for the, the staff member is covered, their family is not. Do they contribute anything to their own retirement plan? That I'm not sure of. I'd have to defer to payroll on that one. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've had those discussions, and those come Understood. up. Understood, and that's one of the things that's being negotiated between the teachers' union I know. I said and, yeah. and yeah. the school district. Yeah, so it's something to keep in mind mm -hmm. when we're planning this budget that that should be a factor. And we're looking at a lot of different um, health insurance providers at this point. So there's, you know, we're, we've talked to Select Health, but we have to put all that on the table with the union and negotiate it. It's not something we can impose necessarily. That's that's coming up this yeah. Year. In May, uh, May f or April, May first, first part. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I suggest that we talk about that? I don't want to cut sure. you off, Barbara, but that topic when we get to that topic in our budget, especially since we have more to get through for this type of budget, and it's already past five thirty. But because we will talk about those things when we cover that, so it's not that we're dismissing it, um, but we can talk more specifically when we cover that portion, if that's okay. Okay. Here's five year history of. All of that information, textbook adoption, the mentor teacher program, publishing budgets, travel budgets. And in service is professional development? In service is professional development. If you go to the website, you'll see that those amounts broke down into much, much more detail than what that 625,000 is showing here. Wow, it's a reduction. Okay, that's what it looks like graphically. Dual immersion budget. Now, one thing I want to say on the, on the next slide, you'll see uh, an in-service portion of a budget. It's included in the prior slide here. But what I want to do is just reference it as, here's the dual immersion program. This is what the dual immersion program has requested the last five years. So it's consistent. OK? okay? And you'll see that uh, the next slide as well that, uh, that they've requested there was a $50,000 allocation this year and a $100,000 allocation next year for startup costs for the magnet school. And a lot of that money is getting paid for library materials and instructional supplies in, in Spanish. Yeah, that was my main question for the startup costs for the $100,000. But 
are, are a lot of those, maybe Molly, you can elaborate on this, because a lot of rooms are just getting moved. Are there additional rooms and materials that are needed for that? Or I'm just curious what, what is included in those. Desks and tables and whatnot will, come, will move with teachers uh -huh. and move from school to school. Uh -huh. Um, and just, then the rest of uh, the money. That will go to signage, so changing the signs in the schools and things like that. Um, and there also will be, um, you know, there could potentially be needs um, for materials at the school, um, such as additional tables or desks. Are the specials classes going to be dual language? Mm-hmm. Make them dual language. And then the schools like Bellevue and Haley that housed a DI program and had a, a small library of Spanish books, will those be moving to the magnet school or will they stay? Oh, thanks. Good question, Penn. For for the detail of what's involved in that hundred thousand dollar number, if you go to the website, It'll be there. that's there. Okay, thank you. All of the detail behind these numbers are all on the website. Okay. Here's the IB program. Again, the in-service budget that's on the next slide is also included in the in-service budget for the total district wide. I just want to make sure of that. That's clear. I, what I want to do is just make sure that these numbers are comparable throughout the years. Are you anticipating that the training workshop budget for this program would be pretty flatline continuing forward because of the constant education requirements of IB, or would, are we going to see that decrease over time? I'm seeing Angie kind of nod yes to the flatline. That's what it looks like graphically. Okay, the learning disability program. You'll see on the next slide that there was a jump last year, and that's because of the Voices program. Is it the Voice 2? Voices 2 program. Okay. 
had $10,000, 310,300 in startup costs, which was reflected in the contracted services as well as the supplies account. And that's what it looks graphically. Special services, now this would be special education, this would be Debbie's, Mrs. Gutnick's uh, accounts. Now, not all of this travel-related uh, expense here on this next one is for Debbie because we have several people that are getting paid out of the special services budget. It would be the social workers, the psychologists, and the behavior specialists, and any kind of interaction they have between multiple buildings, the mileage that they do between those is all. We pay mileage for that. Don't we have contracted services for outside agencies? Some that provide a service is that included in this or is that in a different budget it's in it's in it's in the uh, Medicaid, Medicaid services services. budget on the very top line there that is in there and then one thing that I wanted to point out is the Medicaid account has an offsetting revenue account in the same amount so we do spend approximately four hundred thousand dollars out of this account but we do collect that much money coming back in for Medicaid reimbursements so it's a net zero it's a net zero to the general fund I do not. Where's Debbie? <laughs> we just well, have that I one give you a, a rough estimate. It, it's, it's right around 10%, which is pretty much the national norm. Okay. That, that's, huh? Give or take a little year there, but it's right around that. Okay, this is what the special services budget looks like graphically. So the actual uh, effect on the general fund is. 25,000-ish? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're getting into the district administration budget. Purchase services, you'll see a pretty good size number coming up. But that's allocated between the legal fees budget is 60,000, audit fees is 14,000, elections is 5,000, publishing is 9,000, background checks are 12,000, postage is 10, and dues are 10,000. Okay, and that's what it looks like, comparison over the past five years. What are those dues to? It would be to services. the Idaho Association of School Administrators. Uh, it could be to Rotary Clubs, those types of organizations, national associations that they belong to, national associations of school superintendents. Current practices. I mean, in my mind, I think it's very valuable to belong to those associations, just because you're you're kept up to date on the current trends and what's happening in education and all everything that's going on within the country and on big issues. You know, my membership with the Superintendents Association, um, that's the group that through which we lobby and and uh, put pressure on our legislatures um, to fund student education and exactly. Exactly. Well, that, that, was, that was for the colleges, but, you know, sometimes legislatures will pretend to listen and do whatever they want to do. But um, we, do, we do get together. We, do, we also talk about education within our region. So in Region 4, we, we, we also share some um, resources. So if we're going to bring in some training, a lot of times um, I can take people down to Twin, and we, we pool our resources in order to provide those trainings. So we talk about relevant issues in education and what's in front of us. And I, um, I'm probably in twin. I'm there next week, as a matter of fact, at the, at the superintendent's conference. And there's a little over 20 superintendents in our region, and the legislatures, our local legislatures, come down there and talk to us quite often. And our, our relationships with CSI, we meet on their campus. So, yeah, it, it creates a, um, a close-knit group around so it's the issues. Handle, can you actually no, it's, it yeah, it's, it's, I think it's bi-monthly that, that I meet down there with the um, superintendents. Yeah. would be for, uh, it would be the as superintendent and the assistant superintendent and the board clerk would be out of that category. Anybody else? Uh, I believe Karen is also paid out of that. Karen, the administrative assistant. 
is paid out of that. So there, I, I believe there's four people paid out of that. But, but remember, the legal fees is for the entire district. Uh -huh. The audit the fees is for the entire district. The elections is for the entire district. Publications, publishing is, background is for the entire district. Postage is for everything that happens in the district office. Okay. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with that that the, this category, the district administration pays for, for the, on behalf of the district. Can I ask another question? I, I was thinking of administration as your curriculum director and your special ed supervisor. Are there more or just those three? It's just those four. <clears throat> those other ones are all paid out of like, administ it's uh, like instructional improvement would be the curriculum director. Special education would be the special ed director. Yes, so, Mike, can you go back or to the, yeah, go ahead. So, I'm wondering, and I don't know if you have this done for the next, um, our, our next workshop next week, or if it would be possible. I know we've talked about this before, but for like the 2010, 2011, 2012, I know you don't have them for 13, 14 yet, but to have the actuals. Actual expense for the first, you know, three years, and then the budgets for the next one. Because I know you don't have them yet for the thirteenth, and obviously, you know, fourteen, fifteen is is budgeted. But, you know, is that one thirty eight number coming from the actual from two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen? And that would just it would make it easier for me. To, it would make more sense to me to where those numbers are coming from. Yeah, I, I, I think guess. the easiest way to look at that is to go on the website and look at the financial statements because there is one page in that financial statement that summarizes each one of these different programs, like the district administration program, based on this is actual amount that was budgeted in that, this is what was spent. I mean, I can do that, but the detail is going to be so huge in so many columns that it's going to be really confusing. Right. You know, and I don't, I don't need that detail. But just instead of the, the budget for 2010, 2011, that would be the, instead of the budget being 145.8, it was actually the expenses, the actual expenses, like 142. Yeah, we've had, uh, we've had this conversation. Yeah, yeah I concern, know, we've had this the last couple my, of years. My concern is, is you're actually, you're mixing up actual expenditures of what's happened in the past versus what you're projecting to happen in the future. Right, yeah. What right. I want to do is take, what did we? What were we anticipating at a certain point of time every year, right. consistently? I understand that, but what we anticipate versus what we actually occurred, I feel like looking in the past, the actual what occurred is relevant. Um, because in 2010, we we might have said, yeah, we expected 155,800, but we spent 120, and. Or maybe we spent 170, and looking at the trend as far as the expenditures um, would be helpful. And if it's not something that's put in this presentation, you said that it's on the website, would that be something that you could print out so that we could at least go, okay, that was our budget, our expenditures were this, we're, we're tracking well, so that we know that that 150 makes sense based on previous expenditures and anticipated expenses coming forth. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely something I could do. Uh-huh. It's it, going to take some time to yeah. Put it if you can't incorporate it into a presentation, if you already have the presentation done, I think having that document that you referred to, even just in paper for us to refer to, would be helpful. Just to know that, because even though it mixes it, it like in my head, it, it follows a sequence: actual, actual, actual budget, because that it somehow follows my line of thinking and say, okay, that's what we spent that year. That was that it's a reasonable. Yeah, and then that's why it makes sense to do the 2014-2015 budget. And I understand that you probably already have the presentation done for next week, so I think just having something on paper to refer to would be sufficient. If we could for, do that. For these? For those pre, the three years, yeah. Okay. And if you have any questions about what we're trying to ask, we can follow we can up with that later. later. I, I think what you're asking for is what were the actual expenditures in FY210, 211, yes. yes. 11, 12, 12, 13. Compared to budgeted amounts. So we can compare, compare those two things. And, I mean, I don't need all the details about what was underneath there. And, you know. 
summary. A summary. I guess I'm just looking for that number. What for the, the each program? The actual amount. Yeah. Or even the the total. The total, right? Even the total actual amount. What was spent on the admin program for 2010, 2011. And then Instead the of the breakdown by category, because some of those had like 10 categories, and so it would be very cumbersome to well, review. Right. I mean, if you look at like the maintenance, some of those have hundreds of categories. Right, right. So, just that total so just the total, the total to compare amount. program differences yeah. or make those program comparisons. Okay. Yeah, we're thinking the same thing. <laughs> the business operations budget. Now, this would include the business department and the human resources department. The travel-related expenditures are for, a lot of it's for mileage or in-state type travel to go to conferences or meetings or you know, between buildings, those types of things. Supplies accounts, purchases of district letterhead, envelopes, district office supplies, copy paper, business forms for the district. Would you be able to include in there, I know we get a glossy every what, quarter or something up to all the main, like what that costs? And if you want other information about why we do that and the importance of that, it's in the communications audit, talking about reaching out to our community and educating our community about what the school district is doing and how the funds are being used and just getting them connected to the exciting things that our students are doing. And there is an audit that I think it's online. A communications audit that was done a number of years ago that talked about the importance of these kinds of communications and why they are really necessary. Yeah. You know what? I might have gotten a penny confused with a couple times, Pamela, but it's really very nominal that amount per publication. Okay, here's the business operations program. Comparative over the past five years. And that's what it looks like graphically. Okay, we're into the communications department budget. The publishing, on, did you going to see on the next slide, it includes all of the permanent and portable signage for the different types of events that we have, the budget publication guides, partners in education publications, advertising for the events, weekly updates, the weekly sun, student sponsor updates, honor rolls, those types of things. And that's what the uh, department budget is. Where does website, me, where does website mean in terms of that? It's not on the technology. It comes out of the technology. So That's what it looks like graphically. Okay, we'll get into the Board of Education. The Board of Trustees, this is what their department looks like. The dues pays for the National School Boards Association and the Idaho School Boards Association dues. And the supplies accounts pays for longevity, longevity service awards, board-related supplies, and sympathy-related expenses for the district. Okay, and that's what budget looks like for the board over the past five years. 
Why did our insurance go so cheap? Do we know? It went down a lot? Probably because of the lack of claims that's been against the board. You know? Good. <laughs> Barbara, you looked at me funny when he said that. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Okay, and that's what that looks like graphically. Okay, this was a capital assets budget, and what you're going to see is the expenditures that's come out of this budget has declined quite a bit because some of the some of these projects were paid out of out of the general fund, out of the capital assets department, but prior years they were paid. They were prior to years they were paid out of this budget, but now they're being paid out of the, the maintenance budget. These would be five year maintenance type program expenditures. So here you can see under site components we had the forty one thousand dollars budgeted through here. Those were all for site type repairs, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, those types of things. This was the seventy thousand dollars was to replace the uh, Playground equipment at Hemi or at Haley last year. Building improvements this year. I mean, that, those were expenditures for building type projects that we had that did not fit within the plant facilities budget, as well as the five-year maintenance plan. So now next year we're just paying for, you know, if we have to hire an architect to do uh, <coughs> designs for projects outside of the plant facilities levy or higher engineering type services for outside of the plant facilities levy. That's where this would come from. Okay. Okay. And to end, I, I just wanted to make these types of observations. You know, the department budgets have been pretty consistent over the past five years. The discretionary department budgets, the school budgets, the program budgets, account for less than 15% of the general fund budget. Utility costs are down approximately $300,000 over five years ago. And the departments, it's only requests right now. Nothing's been approved. The actual amounts will, will actually be coming to the board through the normal budgeting process in May and June. So the idea that I want to do or what I want to get to is to, to take a look and see how all of these numbers come together on projected salary increases, on projected new positions, and I have an idea of, of where I want that budget to increase, whether that's 3% or 2% or 1% or 5%. I mean, those will be discussions that we have with the board, and then uh, what we'll do is, is we'll hold everybody accountable to that increase on the overall budget and say, okay, you know, departments, we may have to look at cutting some of that out to see where we land. You know, if we don't want to create new positions, how are we going to reallocate existing staff like we talked about three weeks ago to create those new positions but take care of some things that, you know, may not be as necessary right now. So that, those are the conversations that we'll have coming up in the future with the board. Yeah, Barbara. Just one comment, please. Last I will guarantee you that but if that number will decrease, Barbara. But what you're getting confused is the eighty million dollars is all of our funds. Not just what we're dealing with is just the general fund. Okay, I'm just talking about you just said you will decide what percent of increase. I'm just suggesting that maybe there could be a decrease instead of an automatic increase. But my my observation is based on the general fund only, not all funds. The general fund only, I mean, that's a big decision if you want the general fund to decrease. Because then you're, you're, then you're looking at reducing staff. Actually, that was sort of a, a comment that I had was, as you're looking forward, and, and there were increases in the general fund every year, um, the plant facilities levy has has provided, a, a, it's, a, it's actually the maintenance fund. And so how do you anticipate that the general fund will eventually absorb the costs of the maintenance programs that have been put in place through the maintenance levy 
five years. The five years hence, if that levy is not renewed at the level that it has been. So I'm just wondering, in your fiscal model, how do you plan for the fact that there may or may not be another $60 million levy? Yeah, to answer that question, my guess is the next plant facility levy, if there is one, will not be the $60 million. It will be a reduction at some, at some point. And my guess is, it's actually not a guess, the discussions that the board had five years ago when they passed the plant facility levy was, is at this point forward, the maintenance type needs that the district has will be taken care of in this plant facility levy and future plant facility levies and technology related purchases, equipment, will be paid from this point forward, technology related out of school plant facility levy and into the next plant facility levy will also come out of that. So I think the decision was made by the board at that point in time to relieve the pressures of the general fund of those types of maintenance projects as well as technology needs and to take care of those things through plant facility levies. So essentially, there's a need for to another one will come along, as opposed to, in other words, the first one was $60 million for, for building construction on the high school and Woodside and et cetera. So the next one was essentially $60 million of maintenance plus You know, I, that's, that was the plan five years ago when the plant facility went into effect. The dollar amount, I mean, it, who knows what the dollar amount's going to be, be 16. six years from now or five years from now when we start that process again. But the idea or the, the plan was is to take care of those expenditures in the plant facility fund. Plan B would be, there would be no plan B because there is no other funds that you could <laughs> offset this with. Well, plan B, plan would, be B <laughs> plan B would be to offset those costs of technology related and maintenance related items with a reduction in staff to where you could break even. Right, so that would be plan B. Right. Not only that, but as we look at um, our situation in the district, 50% of our teachers are eligible for retirement within five years. Yes. 40, about. Uh, 40, 40 percent. As you, cost less. as you, as the more mature, more experienced staff retire, they're going to be retiring with sal much higher salaries than the ones coming in. There's, there's also a second um, salary scale that the new, uh, new salary people will be coming in at, which is, which is reflective of the decrease in prices here in Lake County as well. So the board and, and with Mike's help, we've tried to make contingency plans to, we are trying to drop the budget overall. Short of a reduction in force right now, it's very difficult to just drop the amount we spend on salary employees. Yeah, but we can do that through attrition yeah. over time. Okay, so in five years, you'll have a certain amount of people will, will retire at the $80,000 mm -hmm. salary, and more will come in at the 40, 40. That, that's correct, and we did negotiate last year a B schedule, which is a 12% reduction in salaries overall uh, across the whole scale. And so when you look at that long, long term, it saves several million dollars for the district because um, the, the majority of our expense still is in, in salaries and benefits. If, if you look at the general fund, which I've been doing here and adding up some numbers, it is exactly 85% of the general fund is salaries and benefits. Um, and so when you look at um, losing, and the, the, the stabilization cap is 58% of our current general fund. So when you're looking at if, if that went away, I mean, I heard it said it was extra money. If, if you got to cut 58% and 85% of your budget is salaries and benefits, it's got to come from somewhere. 
So um, that's, that's really what keeps us whole. I mean, it's 58% of our M&O, or our maintenance and operation budget, 85% of which is in your teachers and your, and your staffing, all your staff. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where 40, $46.7 million of the 55 is salaries and benefits alone, yeah. and so that's why I would. That's why. Right. So what we need to do is wow. is be very careful about how we treat staffing because that's where the majority of our budget is. So when we get requests, which we have a lot of, we're trying to make sure and look at that responsibly through attrition, through these losses, through through these retirements, to make sure that we're reallocating resource where the need is as opposed to adding resource to the district. It's not that we don't have resource or human resource. It's we have to be very responsible in how we allocate that resource and make sure that every one of those FTEs, we're getting the most bang for our buck and that we've got it where the kids' needs are. So um, that's what we're looking at now as an administrative team. We're meeting tomorrow to have this exact discussion as to how are we going to work as a team to look at all of our retirements and all of our movement and, and, and student enrollment and where are we going to reallocate FTE so that we're not adding to the district but we're still serving the needs of the student population. Yeah, and to really to add on to that as well, since our salary schedule currently is about 15% higher than the state, that has a much bigger impact as well. So I mean you just can't reduce the 188 positions and get back to the state and be level again, it's, a hundred, it's 188 plus the equivalency of that 10 to 15 to percent higher than the state average. So it would really be a reduction in staff of, it would be huge. I mean, I, I know I did this several years ago, and I mean, you would eliminate, it's, it's a very scary scenario. I mean, you would have class sizes of 40. Four day weeks, potentially, like other districts in the state have. Yeah, no. Ken, I just want to clear you. It just kind of mumbled, well, we blossom into our stabilization cap. That's not really true because up until 2006, our schools were funded on the property tax. So we still had that money. So let's say we had, um, we, we were, you know, bringing in, let's say, $53 million through the state, through the property tax. So in 2006, all Idaho schools were taken off the property tax, except for the four districts. Except for us. Yeah. Except for us. So right. we're still on property tax, but they're not on property tax. Exactly. Essentially. So we did not yeah. get, ex like all of a sudden we weren't $29 million yeah. richer. We just didn't get we more. we decided to spend it all <laughs> by hiring new people. Yeah. We, we didn't, we didn't get it ripped years. away. We just didn't get it ripped away. So we were a fortunate district but that did to not retain. Did not get it ripped away. Yes, and then if what would happen well, is we blossomed into the sales tax. Yeah, <laughs> but but really we should all be fighting for all of Idaho to go back on the property right. tax. Right. I mean that's what we need to be fighting for. No, I think our property taxes are. I mean compared to the rest of the nation, are they're so low. Yeah, I, just, I, oh, yeah. I pay a quarter of what I paid in Michigan in property taxes. I mean, but that's what we should nominal. be fighting for. I mean, I just heard on NPR, there's like four districts, and it's probably the ones with the stabilization, that are the only ones not going out for levies. Yeah, yeah. So they have going to, out. Yeah. In the Magic Valley alone. In 2006, you had 44 districts going out for supplemental levies. This year, you have 95 districts on supplemental levies. And most of those districts are operating in a deficit spending mode. We're one of the very few, if not the only one, that is not in that situation where, where we are deficit spending. And those sub yeah. My biggest concern is, is you know, when, when the, the maintenance levy expires, yeah. we've How do you got some extra costs that we, you know, built in. We've built new buildings, we've got, you know, staff to maintain those buildings, we've got new landscapes, and we've got a whole bunch of new stuff. And we've got new technology, and it's going to have to be updated, and then there, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that's right. new. I see what you're saying. Added. Yeah. There, there's How things are gonna that are going to have to be maintained. Right. However, yeah. I do not think, correct me if I wrong, the maintenance cost, let's say for, for Woodside, it's a new school. Um, it, was it built with, uh, it wasn't built with levy funds. No. no. Okay, let's say um, the high school. Yes, it was built with levy funds, but it was built with the last round of levy 
the previous levy. Yeah. Right. Let's say something that was put into effect with the this new levy funds, and there's maintenance for it. Let's say the um, the maintenance building. Let's say there was uh, landscaping around it. That landscaping maintenance still comes out of the general fund. Is that correct? No, not necessarily. Uh, plant oh. facility levy funds can be spent on any new construction type projects. And actually the board has discretion on, they could reallocate maintenance or plant levy funds into projects that weren't even stipulated in the original vote mm -hmm. four years ago, five years ago. So if there was a need for a new facility at some point in time, not an elementary school, you could take the elementary school funds and reappropriate it into that project. So you kind have of the discretion to do that. Kind of in summary of what Penn's talking about and what we've all been discussing, in our general operating budget, back when the levy was passed, they, they looked at that and said, we cannot maintain all of these expenses. If we get this facility, over, this plant and levy. facility levy, some of these costs would be going into there essentially permanently was the intent. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Not $60 million permanent, but maybe... Who knows what, 10 million or something like that? Yeah, my guess, well, yeah. Technology is not going to be nearly as high the yeah. next round, my guess is. Yeah. And the maintenance of the buildings are not going to be. Right, and we're not building. And, and no building. Building yeah. things. So that was, that was a way to basically keep our operations at the same level by using this facility levy. That was the, and the intent was, would be to continue it. Not at that level, but at some level. And if we had to absorb it back in, the plan B is you have to cut right. well, salaries. Is, I mean, so for instance, <laughs> with um, all the cameras in the schools, especially those schools, those cameras are going to be updated to be replaced. I mean, that's technology that's constantly cycling through, correct me if I'm wrong, like every two or three years. Kind of like you copiers. <laughs> Yeah. 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 One thing. One thing we're you know we're very conscious of that. What you're saying is as you build that infrastructure with money, how do you maintain that infrastructure once that levy's off the off the rolls? We we totally get that. But if 85 percent of our M and O is is benefits and salaries, then we're working really hard to keep that at a at a zero growth. So um, the one thing we're not adding is more and more staff, because exponentially, as benefits go up, cost of living goes up, raises go up, that's where your greatest increase to try and maintain is actually in that staffing. So um, you know, that's why we're being very careful, and that's why you've seen a flat, a flat line in the, in the M&O budget. The other thing to remember, and, and I don't know, Mike, maybe you can expound on this, but money that was collected for an elementary that was specifically in that budget is a set aside. So when you talk about this big budget, People throw 80 million out there. I don't think it's 80 million. I think it's what 70. 70 five? or 73. 70. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's less than that. It's because 12 million of that is a set aside for that new building. Right. So you have 12 million set aside for that building. In case that, that is on that is in that budget. Yeah. That is out there. That is that is set aside. You can't access it, but it's got to show up on your balance sheet. But it's money that's there. That if we don't have to access, then we won't use it then that is money that can be used towards some of the continued costs, or it can take time okay. off of the, of the levy. Right. Okay. Is it collecting interest while it's set aside? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate the, the presentation. Mike. I thought it was very informative. I, I appreciate the, the public for coming and asking questions. So thank you very much. And if there's no further questions, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion or meeting adjourned. <laughs>